We are half an hour away from the open of Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Shenzhen. You're watching The China Show. I'm Yvonne Mann with David Inglis. Let's get to your top stories today. Calm across Asian equity markets as investors gear up for earnings season. And, of course, Jay Powell's visit uh, to Capitol Hill. We're looking at TSMC, of course, this hour after the U.S. listed shares briefly surpassed $1 trillion in market value. Now, Chinese stocks are under pressure, though, with a key gauge nearing correction. Bonds in focus as well as the PBOC new liquidity operations triggers a sell-off in the bond markets there. Plus, we'll be looking at how Hong Kong is rolling out the red carpet for wealthy Chinese while rival Singapore steps up scrutiny of foreign money. As David mentioned, it is pretty calm out there, quiet it's another way, but we are at least trading sideways slightly to the upside here when it comes to risk assets here today. Take a look at Asia Pacific Index. We're basically flat, but again, the U.S. was still able to notch that 35th straight record for the S&P yesterday there. So uh, that certainly is helping out, I guess, lift sentiment ahead of Powell's testimony, of course, and we're waiting for any signs of clues of whether the Fed is ready to at least signal that they're ready to cut and start this easing cycle. So treasuries are kind of not moving, they're not doing too much here this morning. We take a look at how bond markets in Asia are performing as well. Crude, we're watching very closely here, just given how oil markets have been looking at this hurricane barrel, which this seems like the risk to its Texas or the Texas operations there has lessened in a way. So oil did fall and has been holding on to those losses there as well. Gold uh, getting a little bit of a bid here this morning as well, but certainly that has been the sort of anti-dollar trade of late here. But yeah, 108 for euro dollar. We're seeing not that much movement when it comes to FX uh, and currencies here as well. You flip the boards, though, a lot going on in China. We'll talk about the equity side in just a bit. But really, that sell off in CGBs yesterday mm. was something we haven't really seen for some time. In fact, Chinese bonds have basically sold off by the most. This is what we're talking about CGBs as well as credit and the like uh, in two months yesterday as well. In fact, that one year yield at one point jumped as much as seven basis points, which is the biggest increase as we mentioned in two months. Things are stabilizing a bit right now. We're seeing yields heading back slightly lower. But yes, there is still a bit of confusion about what the PBOC unveiled on Monday with these temporary reverse repos there and what happened at the end of the close uh, when markets did close. So certainly we're going to digest through that and what this all means. Was it really a signal about tightening policy or not? And why is the market seeing it as a negative? You take a look when it comes to how the setup for the open is concerned. We're pretty much flat when it comes to A50 futures here this morning. And we're watching very close to that currency still at 728. Oh, yeah. Keep in mind, correction watch for eight shares. Yeah, the Hang Seng China index is about a quarter of 1% to, to that 10% threshold that dropped from the May 20 high, as Yvonne is pointing out as well, right? So we're looking at bonds, equities, and on the one-year bond, for example, the biggest spike uh, going back to, I think, about November of this year. We put that on a chart visually. This is how it looks uh, for you guys as well. There you go, that big move that we had on uh, on Monday, it takes us into what really day two looks like today, perhaps, uh, in the CGB space and also equity markets, right? And, you know, when you talk about equity markets, we're near a correction in, on the Hang Seng China Index. We are in a correction on MSCI China on the Hang Seng Index. Uh, s somewhat diverged from this, but e equally disappointing, let's put it that way, is what's happening in the onshore market, right, where turnover is falling. The CSI 300 has dropped, I think it's now a fifth straight day. And yeah, we are in fact technically oversold based on some indicators. We'll get to that in a moment. Now, in terms of other things happening today, we have three trading debuts, I think two in Hong Kong and one in mainland China. Plus we are entering, we, have, we are in the window possibly for the release of June credit numbers. Stay tuned for that. In the meantime, though, let's get a sense of why this equity market is lacking enthusiasm. Let's put it that way. Winnie was joining us here on set, China Equity Strategist at Pofa Securities. Good morning to you. How are you? <laughs> Good. How are you? Why does this market keep faltering? Mm, yeah. I think if we look at the different drivers, right, the macro factor, the dividend, the earnings, the external factors, and the policy, uh, macro data, first quarter surprise on the upside, right? Mm. So that's when sales that were upgrading GDP forecast. But in May, June, the data actually sequentially start to weaken, especially when we look at consumer confidence, look at some of the retail sales data. Um, 
dividend, which was the best performing strategy in first half this year. But many SOEs actually ex dividend in June, July, in middle of the year. Yeah. And many of them do not pay interim or won't pay interim until like January, February next year, which means there's no dividend payout in the next six months or so. So that pillar is also kind of fading away, at least for the very near term. Earnings, we're going to get earnings in the next month or so. As I said previously, consensus forecasting 14 percent. Um, and I think it's probably going to be mid low single digit. So I think there's still significant downside for earning revision. And external factor, as we're getting into the busy election season toward the second half of the year, the geopolitical tension might only get worse, the tariffs, this uh, protectionism. So finally, the only thing that can support the market to retest the main high is probably policies, mm. right? So I think the next week is a key thing, political event is a key thing markets watching. If there's positive catalyst, market could go up 10, 15 percent to retest the high in May. But uh, you know, for no non event or disappointment, market could retest the mid April lows. And what are expectations now in the plenum? Mm. Is, is it just low? I mean, what were people saying to you? Yeah. I think expectations are not high, yeah. right? But still, I know like hedge fund investors see that as a potential policy put. So they are unwilling to short ahead of the plenum. But if plenum confirms to be more neutral to negative catalyst for the market in the near term, this might become a catalyst for sale. Well, what, what, what do you want to hear? What, what, what will be potent enough to get us that 10, 15 percent upside? Yeah. So I think from market investor concern perspective, property market, right? Previously, there were high expectations on destocking on some sort of a national platform, right. which didn't realize in the May 17 policy package. So, you know, many investors were asking, why not, right? What are they waiting for? So I think continued effort to, to drive the property in terms of destocking, in, in terms of stabilizing the expectations on property prices are still very, very important. People also care about employment, consumer confidence. Right. So, you know, any effort to promote new growth drivers to promote employment, that's important for consumption and for property, home buying confidence as well. And finally, I think, you know, externally, there are more concerns about tariffs and overcapacity and price war deflationary pressure. So what China is going to do ahead of, you know, in, in, in light of these external trade tensions and to address some of the overcapacity issue in different parts of its economy. So let's talk about performance then. I mean, the second quarter, you, you, you saw pretty good performance when it comes yeah. to what? You mentioned SOEs. I mean, it's part of that is the utilities, the yeah. financials. Yeah. The, yeah. Is that, are you saying that now it's time to trim those? What are you looking at for the third quarter now? Yeah. Um, so we're saying taking a pause in the SOE strategy, right? You know, previously, when I start to talk about the barbell, one side is the de defensive SOEs in January last year. Mm. Generally, overseas investors do not believe it. Say, no, 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 we don't do SOE. Definitely not SOE banks, right? But. 18 months later now, I think SOE become very consensus. Even when I was marketing in the U.S. in June, you know, the EM long list in New York City, in San Francisco, they all own SOE banks, right, and some other SOEs. So one, I think, position has become a bit crowded. That it's a very, very consensus strategy. And two, as I mentioned, you know, banks as a sector, telco as a sector were up 20% year to date, mm -hmm. and oil and gas were up 40%. So after the share price rally, dividend yield actually declined. Yeah. There were banks as a sector were yielding 10% in January low. Now the yield is less than 7%. Many of the stock yielding only 5, 6%. So yield become less attractive, but also timing wise, you know, they just ex dividend, right? In the past few weeks, and the next payout is probably a well away. Now, some sectors like oil and gas, like telcos, they pay interim in September. Yeah. So there's some support for specific stocks, but majority would not have payout in the next six months. So what, what is an easy sell now where positioning may or may not be crowded, and you're still getting investors welcoming the idea with open arms, for example? Um, I think, you know, okay, I got a lot harder. of pushback on the SOE taking yeah. profit uh, story. So people still want to own oh. SOE. Um, our advice is for investors to add quality beta on the low. So, for example, some of the Internet names, they are getting okay. into the lower bond, lower range of the trading band, right? And I think the worst in terms of flow, derating is probably behind. So I would selectively add the, uh, the, the, the Internet names. Uh, consumer, I think people are becoming much more bearish, more, more 
more concern on the consumer names. They're willing to pick very small, specific niche names within consumer, but the large cap names like the liquors, you know, there's uh, a lot All of ties, concern. Like, yeah. Right? Um, yeah. Yeah, you mentioned about earnings projections at 14%, still high. You're saying it's, what, single digits or so? Low single digits. Where, where are we going to see that mismatch, that displacement, you think? Yeah. And when the sectors? What gets revised lower. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, earning revision actually became positive in May, June. Uh, I guess one is partly because Internet were reporting earnings in May, and Internet earnings bottom line was generally okay. But also, I suspect that's partly to, to, to do with market rally in April, May, that, you know, sales that need to justify the PO upside, so there's more optimism <laughs> in terms of earnings upward revision, which apparently, you know, the rally didn't sustain as of now. So um, I think in the, 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 the July, August, the first half earnings season, we are probably going to see pretty broad based earnings downgrade. Um, are you looking at or just looking at the macro picture and the mm. possibility that hopefully they deliver pro-growth stimulus? Uh, is there anything on the monetary side that you think might be on deck that they could deliver big enough, whether that's yield curve control or mm -hmm. all the conversations mm -hmm. recently yeah. that might spur the market into, in, into an awakening. Uh, very unlikely. I oh. think there, there's a lot of conflicting goals, right? For them, defending the currency stability is probably a, a very high priority. Mm. Um, and the falling bond yield, the falling interbank market rate is certainly adding pressure to the currency. So for the short term, they are very, very unlikely to do big policy bazooka or, or, or big stimulus on the monetary side. Also, they need to reserve policy tools for potentially January next year, right? Mm -hmm. What if the U.S. election resulted in a sharp ex uh, uh, increase in trade tariff, 60 yeah. percent blanket tariff? They need to reserve some policy tools for first half next year. And from now, for now, you know, GDP data are okay, right? And the stock market are doing okay. So, you know, I guess from from policymaker perspective, there's not much sense of urgency or sense of crisis that they have to do the bazooka now. You mentioned about the election risk. Um, did, did, yeah. the, did the latest presidential debate change your mind in any way? Or are you, are, is your team at least gaming out scenarios mm. of what November is going to look like now for Chinese markets? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, directionally, it's probably very consistent. Right, whichever party wins, the direction is very consistent in terms of areas that they're focusing yes. on, you know, AI, semiconductor, uh, biosecurity, uh, biotech, things like that. But I think it's more about consistency versus unpredictability, yes. right? And currently we're looking at probably higher policy unpredictability, potentially more chaotic, less, uh, uh, po uh, le le less disciplined uh, new policies coming out in January or first quarter next year. That's why China probably need to have better preparation. Winnie, always great to start the show with you. Winnie Wu there, China equity strategist at B of A Securities. Coming up next, we'll be talking Asian economies with the Tixis and why they see China's domestic demand remaining weak. And, of course, what's been really going on with that whole PBOC signaling yesterday as well. Chun Yuan joins us there pretty close a few minutes away. We're counting down the opens of trade in Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong. This is The China Show. Brett, welcome back. You're watching The China Show. The midpoint of the session is now seven out, 7.13.10. And yeah, as usual, quite a bit of a spread there against where expectations are. Uh, a bit of weakness coming through in the Chinese currency. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. there's still a lot of questions. People are still scratching their heads about what we heard from the PBOC yesterday. The CGB sell-off seems to have stabilized a bit today, but we're still kind of digesting what the, all the policy signals are yeah. showing here. Let's bring in Twin Nguyen to give us some answers here. Emerging Asia senior economist at Natixis. The market would seem to be confused by these kind of temporary reverse repos. It seems like they were thinking this means rates are going up. What do you think the intent was from the PBOC? I think the intent here is to show that they care about the currency and they prioritize the currency. They know and the markets know the move forward for China, unless there's a lot of stimulus coming, which markets also think is very unlikely, is that rates need to move lower because real rates is too tight, right? So you're going to get CPI that's going to show demand rather weak and the PMI show demand rather weak. So as we had to get weak data, right, people expect rates to respond to respond to China's economic cycle, which is going downward. However, that means that also it leads to outflows, right, um, um, for equities and so on and so forth, particularly because the, the housing market recovery is very weak as well. 
So as a result, the POC essentially is saying that we're prioritizing FX at the moment. And what that means is that we need to wait for the Fed to cut rates so that the FX pressure isn't there, right? So that we can have more monetary policy independence. So the moves are a bit confusing because I'm moving on a longer end to raise to longer term rates, and also they're they're suppressing um, the interbank rates to make sure that it's not a lot of volatility. But the, if you zoom it all out, yeah. it is just to say we understand that the economic conditions are very weak. But at the moment, we want to make sure that we arrest a lot of these challenges, particularly on the FX side, and that's where we prioritize at the moment. And I think for a lot of central banks, particularly for Asian governments, have economic cycles that are diverging with the Fed. They want the U.S. to kind of synchronize, right? And the good news is that I think the room for the PBOC to more independent, to have lesser pressure on the FX is coming soon, probably in the fourth quarter, probably as early as we can have right move for the U.S. is September, right? Um, if you look, we have CPI data also coming out, not just China, mm. and it's going to show deceleration, right? Um, and with the jobs number decelerating, uh, much of the jobs number in the U.S. is driven by public sector, and with state, local governments, um, the, the budget tightening, we're likely to see tighter rates in the U.S. biting. So, in other words, the PBOC is biting time, uh, focusing on FX. Mm. Um, and meanwhile, if you're in the equity uh, market, you're probably not feeling great every time you get a weak data. You don't have the core responding response. And this is one of the reasons why we have mainland equity weakness. Okay. You mentioned waiting for the Fed. How does that apply to other central banks who, you know, some of whom have signaled they're prepared to cut rates even before the Fed. You know, case in point, I think the, Philippi the Philippines yesterday said August is possible. Uh, the, the BOK has signaled almost as much that perhaps not this week, but in, in the next meeting after this, uh, what are your thoughts on when they might move? Why? So I think everyone's waiting. Um, you know, they say this because they want to make sure that the weakness on the FX isn't really there to prepare markets as the move forward yeah. uh, um, isn't really helping. But the really the, the dollar, even though it's strengthened a bit, mm. Asian FX is still quite weak, right? Mm. Um, inflation is one area where it's helping. But we really need the dollar to soften quite significantly. And what's very clear is that the move forward is increasingly clear. So this is why central banks are increasingly more confident saying this. Um, I think for the Bank of Korea, it's less pressure than the, 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 the Philippines, right? Uh, because it does have accelerating uh, uh, GDP, mostly because of semiconductor, while households and construction sectors are feeling a bit tight on the, the real, on real interest rates. Now, as a result of this, I do think that um, the BSP is likely to move faster because it's also hiked quite significantly to defend FX during this tightening cycle rather than uh, the BOK, which has paused uh, for quite some time now, right? Uh, um, so, 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 so for, say, central banks in Asia, some have more move, uh, more room than others. Um, and, and, and I think that has a lot to do with where the economic cycle is. And that has to do with the ICT cycle, right? Taiwan is an example with the upturn of the, uh, the cycle and so on and so forth. Mm. Where countries where they really need to have more monetary independence. The dollar is still a huge driver seat, and I think that room will open up. So, so for Asia, that will get more respite. Um, we do see rate cuts coming through um, in the second half, whether it's August or the fourth quarter, it is coming through. And I think the question that people should really ask also, not just that when they start the cycle, is that how sharp the cycle will, 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 uh, will fall, right? Yeah. And where it will settle. And I think this is where a lot of Asia will differ from the Fed, right? Mm -hmm. Because we um, didn't hike that much. For example, if you look at the low yielders like Thailand or Malaysia, yeah. Because we didn't hike that much. There isn't a lot of cuts coming through as well. So the cycles may be turning, but we also don't have a lot of room to cut, unlike last time, for so example. If the Fed's gonna be, do you think the Fed's going to be pretty shallow, too, in their rate-cutting cycle? I mean, in Asia, you think it's going to be even less than that, basically? Um, actually, no. We actually think the Fed cycle is going to be quite sharp in 2025. Um, um, oh. uh, and, 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 and as a result, I think a lot of respite is coming through in Asia, and it's coming through more okay. pronounced um, when it's clearer that the cycle will be sharper. So okay. there's a lot of uncertainty at the moment. Um, uh, and some of that uncertainty is being cleared because we're seeing um, softness in U.S. data, but it will be much clearer as non-farm payroll and inflation continue to to decelerate meaningfully. And I think this is where the respite is coming in. And a lot of central banks are just buying time. Do rate differentials matter? Uh, the reason I ask that is if the Fed cuts, the central banks are going to cut anyway. So does that mean it's still a stronger dollar to 
I wanted to ask a follow-up when you said, is, you know, we need this dollar to soften. Is the dollar going to soften? Well, our key view is that the dollar is going to fall much more than Asian FX, right? So it's really more uh, um, that if when in, 20, in, in 2024, it's not going to be a lot. It's going to be 50 basis points. Mm. The, the question is, is it September? Um, the start is in November. Our call is September and then December. So that's only 50 basis points. But it's 2025 that's going to make a difference. And as the dollar falls, because it has a lot of room to fall, right? Real rates are very tight, right? We're at 5 5 for the upper end, inflation is going to decelerate to a lower threes, and it's going to continue to decelerate. And our key view is that it's going to fall into target by the end of 2025 versus the Fed expectations of end 2026. And as a result, we're going to get a lot of respite, right, uh, for the, the Asian central banks, the ones that have felt a lot of pressure, right, the Thai bot, uh, the Malaysian Granite, Ringgit, and so on and so forth. Okay. And that's really where it's coming from because the differential is going to be the dollar falling much yeah. more. Trent, thank you. Trent Nguyen there, Natixis Emerging Asia Senior Economist, joining us here this morning. Of course, here's your pre-market in Hong mm. Kong just opening up. We talked about we're still on correction watch when it comes yeah. to the HSCEI. Looks like we are, we could be heading that direction. We'll yeah, see. we're probably going to get there today. Yeah, um, and there you go. At least we see this sell-off in CGB stabilizing just a little bit here today. But yeah, a 713 handle for that PBOC fix, so a little bit on the weaker side. We're seeing a 728, 729 levels for the currency. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. All right, we're watching some of these trading debuts in Hong Kong oh, today. No. It's a busy week. Oh, no. Look we were at that. talking about six or listings this week, but it's not going on a good start so far. So we're talking about Bai Wang and Fang Zhou. Yeah, not the best debut there. We're seeing Fang Zhou in particular. That's down tanking some 42% right now, Dave. Yeah, um, it's big. And I think we have one more trading debut that's on the Chinese mail. And just note, Fang Zhou, of course, the, the IPO was 16.6 times. Uh, over uh, oversubscribed. Uh, okay, let us pivot now away from the trading debuts today and have a look at the broader markets where uh, certainly the, the down arrow story is continuing, particularly here in Hong Kong, where, you know, at these levels, and, you know, I have to emphasize things could change at the open, we could bounce back, but at these levels, the Hang Seng China Index is set to join the Hang Seng Index and MSCI China in a technical correction that's 10% down from the May 20 peak. Yeah, we're also mm. watching some analyst actions here. Citigroup adding Anta Sports that downside 30-day short-term view. They're setting weakness in Phila sales in particular. iFly Tech cut to a sell at UOB and Sino Biofarm rated a new strong buy at Founders Securities. We've got the open coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. You're watching The China Show. We're kind of on the open of markets where we continue to see that this bearish sentiment continuing for another day when it comes to Chinese stocks in particular. What we talked about already, the Hang Seng China Enterprise Index looks set to enter into that correction likely today, just given this down our story that we're seeing uh, on Hong Kong today. We got some pretty bad debuts in the Hong Kong market as well. It's supposed to be one of the busiest weeks uh, for IPOs in Hong Kong. And again, we can continue to watch what goes on in the CGB market market, at least today, take a bit of a pause in this sell-off, Dave. Yeah, the CGBs are catching a bit after, what, four or five days of, of losses. Um, yeah, I think we'll have to unpack that story a little bit further, really, what the PBUC announced yesterday, what that means for the yield curve, what that means for the long end, and, and, you, know, and, and you know, narrowing that rate corridor. Now, as it pertains to some parts of the equity market, Ivan is pointing out, of course, we'll get to the Hang Seng China Index in just a moment here. Uh, Malta is very much in focus following, really, this, this, this downdraft we're seeing in consumer staples. Now, we talked to two people these last two days or so. Uh, for example, I think we always speak with Morningstar yesterday, and what they're, they're getting more interested in revisiting some some options here as some of these liquor makers fall that we just we did just speak with uh, Bank of America who had the opposite view and they're saying there's you know the earnings outlook isn't as clear just yet so they're staying clear as far as some of these big names are concerned uh, we're down again on the Shanghai comp flat at the open I think we're down five days now uh, on the CSI threat well six days including if we close lower today 
Um, let's flip the boards, please, as far as Hong Kong is concerned. The Hang Seng Index, Hang Seng China, and of course, MSCI China. So this one is actually in correction. This one is. This one is set to enter a correction at about these levels, right? So just keep an eye. 35, uh, not this one. Where is Hang Seng China? There we go. There. 62, 61, I believe, is the level we're looking at there. Now, all that being said, the preference seems to be what's emerging as the narrative here is Chinese Internet. That seems to be the best the best group of stocks, the best, uh, the best sell, if you will, easiest sell uh, among these group of stocks. We heard it from Bofa. We're looking at price action that suggests that the Hang Seng tech, tech Index isn't falling as much. Um, we're looking at the banks, too, given this melt up in yields. Just watch it very, very closely. Uh, flip the boards, please. A couple of stocks we're tracking. BYD is making some moves. So uh, Turkey, one billion plants. Uh, we're also looking at, based on the reporting, um, in mainland China, we could be looking at also, uh, I think it's an 890, 92 million U.S. dollar plant uh, in the Guangdong province. Anta came out with some guidance on earnings as far as Anta branded uh, sales are concerned. Zijun mining, gold mining stock, also out with uh, some decent guidance there as well. And just a brief look at Heidi Lao, which uh, in the last few days has really seen substantial downside in the stock, still down today. Very quickly, a, a glance at technicals just to, and you know, we revisit this chart every few days or so, um, and it does appear after five days of losses, we're again below the lower Bollinger Band. We're also at about 25 now, 27 as of the close, at 25 now on the 14-day relative strength index, which if you look at the technicals, uh, are indicating some oversold conditions across these markets, but is it a buying opportunity given just the lack of momentum that's been sapped out of this market, Yvonne. Yeah, as Winnie Wu mentioned from B of A, right, if we do see some positive catalyst coming through from this plen plenum next week, yeah. we could see easily 10 to 10, 50 percent upside, right? Um, but then again, she says expectations are basically from low to moderate right now. And she definitely did say when it came to some of those SOEs, which was one of the star performers in the second quarter, time to maybe start pulling back from those because a lot of these stocks are actually trading X dividend now. We're not going to see anything uh, more substantial maybe until the later part of yeah. this year. So certainly there's one strategy that they're looking at very closely as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, it just goes to show how important next week is. But then, I don't know, no, no one's really anticipating anything that's big either. Yeah, because the, the announcements tend to be more structural and longer term, which, yes. you know, are obviously very important given the structural issues at work here. Is the market going to get its short-term fix that it wants is, is probably the, you know, to your point, low expectations there. Uh, the earnings story, we're moving into that these next few weeks or so, and she thinks, Winnie Wu, 14% yep. is still too high. Um, and she's looking at maybe low single-digit yep. earnings growth as well. And I think on the SOE story, interestingly how, you know, just I think last year, it was very difficult to sell the idea yeah. of SOEs and dividends, and it's become now a very crowded trade. Consensus, she said. <laughs> yeah. And it's hard to tell them to actually trim, she says, because yeah. people are pretty much stuck on yeah. it for now. Uh, let's bring in Jeannie Yu, our mm. Asia Stocks reporter. Tell us a little bit more about these markets. What's your team watching out for here today? Um, the key thing we're watching out is whether the Hansen Index is going to erase the year today gains. Oh. Um, another, yeah, it's not Way surprising. Way to start this not, not very surprising. bullish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, still, it's a, it's a milestone. Like, uh, okay. psychologically, it w would hurt some, you know, investor sentiment, like whether this is this is a market that should keep staying. Um, and um, in the meantime, we're watching out for any, you know, um, things, um, you know, ahead of the plenum, hmm. especially like um, earlier, th earlier this week, we saw the national teams, you know, very being very active buying those um, um, ETFs they used to buy during the uh, January and February market plunge. Mm. Um, so we're seeing those um, activities getting uh, a little bit more active um, in recent two weeks, uh, especially after the Shanghai Composite fell below 3,000 key level um, in late June. Um, so we could see, um, like, if, if we see increasing volumes of those um, ETFs, it could be a sign that national teams actually, you know, they're trying to step in. Um, and then and there is a theory that you know um, the Hong Kong dividend season is having like a, it's reaching a peak in July. Mm. So um, the Central Huijin, which bought all the national banks back in February, they're getting a big paycheck yeah. um, this month. So um, like which may enable them, you know, to buy more ETFs if, if they need to buy, if they need to stabilize the sentiment before the key policy meeting oh, next week. Look how that worked, out, right? <laughs> the, uh, you guys also put out this piece on it's all relative, right? So you know. Do do you own Hong Kong as a way to you know, gain China exposure? Or do you go through the mainland as well? 
And it seems to be that Hong Kong is the place to own Chinese shares based on relative performance here, Hang Seng Index versus the CSI 300. Yeah, we see we see like actually the Hong Kong gauge like HCI, HSI, they have been beating the um, onshore benchmarks for four consecutive months. Um, I guess one thing is like um, Hong Kong stocks has always been cheaper. Um, versus the issues. So if the like if those funds that want to they need to have a place to stay, they have a China mandate, like maybe they'll choose Hong Kong. And and, and then the second thing I think is um, um, dividends um, paid out by the um, Hong Kong markets this year. Um, I think it's said to be the highest in five years. So um, this could be a big reason for those um, you know the income seekers, you know those income funds who need stable return if they are not seeking really big capital gains. Um, Hong Kong would be a place to stay. So relatively versus the, the Asian market. Jeannie, thank you. Jeannie Yu, there, our Asia Stocks reporter, are the latest when it comes to these Chinese equities. A quick look at some other top global headlines that we're tracking for you. The left-wing alliance that won the most seats in French parliamentary elections says it will nominate a prime minister in the next few days. Sunday's vote produced a divided parliament with no clear majority. And the left's candidate for premier will almost certainly need to win support from President Emmanuel Macron's group, which won the second biggest number of seats. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban has met with Chinese President Xi Jinping during an unannounced visit to Beijing that followed a similar surprise trip to Moscow for talks with Vladimir Putin. EU leaders have sought to distance themselves from Orban's shuttle diplomacy, which comes as Hungary takes over the bloc's rotating presidency. Orban heads to Washington this week for the NATO annual summit. Speaking of Washington, President Biden is working to quell Democratic infighting about his presidential campaign, writing a letter to lawmakers and telling donors he's determined to stay in the race. Let's bring in Derek Wallbank, our managing editor, to get us up to speed. Yeah, Derek, what's the, let's start with that. What, what's the latest here? What is, what's the, what, what is the campaign looking like at this point? David, the word of the day is defiance. Uh, a defiant President Biden said he would not be dropping out. He is all in, and it is time for Democrats to get on board. That's it. That's the that's uh, all in a sum. That's where we are. Um, you know, we've talked before, right? That Joe Biden has all the cards. He holds all the keys here, right? He has a preponderance of the Demo Democratic delegates at the convention. He won all of the states. He's, he's the guy, right? The person standing in Joe Biden's way right now is Joe Biden. Uh, if he wants to step aside, it is his call. And I say all of that to say there is not a process at this point where a lot of other people are going to be able to compel Biden to make a decision. They have to convince Biden to make a decision. And what he is putting forward right now is essentially a kind of pressure tactic to tell the rest of Democrats, look, you at this point have a binary choice. We are past the point where we were going to make a change. I'm all in and you should be all in with me, too. Now, that, David, has not stopped Democrats from making some uh, you know, from expressing some concerns, right? You do have Democrats, particularly some in swing districts, who have either not come out and publicly backed Biden or said, look, I'm concerned that he can't win, or even a couple, about 10 or so, who've said uh, that they think that Biden should stand aside for somebody else. In that case, most likely it would be Kamala Harris. But at the very top of the party, if I'm thinking about my Chuck Schumer's, my Hakeem Jeffries's, my Nancy Pelosi's, my Jim Clyburn's, I have not seen a groundswell among those people that Biden might really, really focus on. They've all so far stuck with the president and are standing by him. So he's getting that space to be able to continue on. Uh, what about these donors, right? I mean, usually they have a bit of sway in all this. Um, you know, are they able to convince Biden in any way? Well, Ivana, it's a great question you asked, and we've actually got a story up right now on Bloomberg.com in the terminal that I would point people to, which basically says that the donors are increasingly uh, kind of becoming resigned to the fact that they're not going to be able to sway Biden. And, and Biden has made a point of this to say, look, you know, I, I would like to have their money, I'd like to have their support, but they're not going to be the ones to tell me what to do here. And so if you're a big name Democratic donor, you do face a choice right now. Do you want to keep giving here? Do you want to sort of sit on the sidelines? 
Uh, there are some people, uh, Bill Ackman is someone who has donated to Democrats in the past, um, who, who said, look, if it's a binary choice between Biden and Trump, I'm going to go for Trump. Uh, you know, so, so there are a lot of choices that people have to make. But again, in that binary context, Bill Ackman aside, uh, Biden is generally reasonably confident. He, he believes, his theory of the case is that if you make it a contest between Biden and Trump, then Biden does well. Uh, the president is very fond of saying, you know, don't compare me to the, al to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. That's really where he wants to be right now, as well as to suggest that among Democrats, there is no alternative. All right, Derek, thank you. Derek Weldbank there with the latest. And we do have some lines crossing here from Fox News that uh, the former President Trump and the Republican nominee would like to announce his pick for vice president during the Republican National Convention. So that's what we're hearing here. So likely will come within a week. we got plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Okay, um, just to check on the first day at school, and you know, typically it's not it's it's not your best foot forward sometimes, right? It takes a few days to really get a grip of the the parameters of the playground. So you have two trading debuts in Hong Kong today. Fang Zhou is a, an online chronic disease management platform, and Bai Wang is a uh, it provides enterprise digital solutions. Uh, one is well, both are down one more than the other, of course, and really setting us up for a, quite a busy IPO week here in, in Hong Kong. Yvonne. Yeah, I think six in total this week alone. Let's get to our equity capital markets reporter, Felipe Pacheco. He's with us. Okay, so not a good debut, but what's behind these wave of deals? Yeah, that's a very interesting start to the week, right, Yvonne? <laughs> we have six deals in the pipeline. Uh, definitely not a good start for Feng Zhou, but uh, I think it's very fair to say that it's, it's very hard to say that there's a trend for uh, debuts at this moment. We've seen some recent companies that came to market that actually performed quite well. Of course, there was a correction after a few days of trade, and now we see this very strong start, a uh, very hard start. I wouldn't be surprised to see a correction, uh, actually an increase tomorrow. This volatility has been part of the game with those IPOs that are fairly tiny at this point. We have, within the six names that we have coming to market, the biggest of them is actually uh, debuted on Friday, around 1.5 uh, billion uh, Hong Kong dollars. It's an air, aircraft uh, manufacturer. And then we have the day before, Chenti Technology, which is actually a hide hailing firm. Also, uh, the fairly sizable deal this week. All of those six IPOs together, they raised about 550 million U.S. dollars. So this gives you a dimension that we are still talking about very small deals. But when we talk to the market, when we talk to analysts and to bankers that are looking at the pipeline, they say that there is a solid pipeline of deals in Hong Kong. The exchange has confirmed that before. They say that they have been getting a lot more interest by companies. I think that right now the main point is when they decide to list at what price and who is actually buying who are, compo are those composing the books because if you go with what a lot of the the uh, specialists the bankers say uh, friends and family deals sometimes you have a start like this yeah yeah well does does it continue does the trend continue into the third quarter uh, we are expecting to have a much busier third quarter than what we've seen in the first and the second quarter Dave I think it's okay. fairly uh, but it's, it's important to highlight that there is a much better sentiment towards Hong Kong in general, Hong Kong stocks, uh, companies that were initially eyeing to come to market in the first and the second half of uh, the uh, second quarters of the year are now actually making uh, plans to move forward with their offerings. And of course, there's been a very clear indication by China, by Beijing, that they will support Chinese companies that are seeking to raise money to do that outside of the mainland. So those names that initially were considering going to Shanghai or to Shenzhen, they are probably now looking at Hong Kong for their listings. All right, Felipe, thank you, Felipe Pacheco, their equity capital markets reporter. And yeah, as we talk about maybe more of these IPOs coming back to the city, you know, everyone's sort of talking about where, where the money is coming, right? Yeah. And, and, and it seems like after five years, of really a lot of this money going to places us. to Singapore yeah. during the pandemic. We're starting to see signs that maybe the wealthy are coming back to the city. Yeah, interesting. This We have a piece on this, right? Yeah. And the, the graphic actually tracks number of millionaires. <laughs> so I think we're on track for a net 200 
uh, inflow of, of, of actual millionaires, I believe, is, 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 the, is, is the metric here as well. And, and a lot of this, too, is what's been going on, of course, where some of the money flocked to during the pandemic, which was Singapore. And, of course, the money laundering, the high-profile money laundering case there, and they're tightening, of course, their screws there. So that's leading, I guess, in some ways to more business for the private, some of the wealth desks here in the city. Yeah, I mean, also in Hong Kong themselves have really tried to really create some more incentives, right, to mm. rival the likes of Singapore. You know, we, saw, we saw those initiatives with the family office tax concessions, you know, visa and residency programs visa that program. have been changed as well. So at least it's working. You're starting to see early signs of that here as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, another story that if they come here, yeah, how will they get around? How are they getting around? Yeah. Yeah. Let's get to our next story yeah. here. If the Lamborghini is acting up. <laughs> Gotta call some, call an Uber, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we're staying with Hong Kong with this story, right? So the government has outlined long anticipated plans to regulate ride hailing services, potentially limiting the scope of Uber. Let's bring in our China tech reporter Sarah Jung with more on this. So just give us the details of what they, they're trying to regulate now. Yeah, so as you mentioned, I mean, Uber's been in Hong Kong for 10 years now, but it's never been regulated. So now the government is rolling out these proposals to regulate it by asking all the platforms to be licensed, asking them to license their drivers, asking the vehicles to be licensed. So basically creating this regulatory framework for them to operate under. Mm -hmm. The problem is now how many licenses, how many permits will each of these platforms be able to have? How long will this take? What are some of the details? So that's what everyone is looking for now when it comes to the actual regulation. Do we know, do we have an idea of how many licenses? As you mentioned, that's a key question, right? Because that affects supply. And do we know the timetable for when this might be put in place? Yes. So the government is conducting a study on this this year, okay. and they said that they're planning to have this framework ready by next year, or a proposal that they would, they would roll out. Hmm. Um, currently, there are only 1,500 permits for private cars to, you know, um, carry passengers. But of course, none of the platforms are actually regulated themselves. So they're sort of operating under this gray zone. Right. Um, Uber is saying that, you know, they welcome the government to sort of discuss regulations and to have this framework, but they're a little bit concerned about the caps, potentially, that the government could put a number of permits mm. um, for these kind of cars. And this has sort of been a long, I guess, discussion about, you know, the competition with taxi drivers and Uber, and, and I think even some taxi drivers pretended to be passengers of Uber to try to tell them to, yeah. you know, go to the police and all that. I mean, I mean, is, is anything that's going to resolve kind of what we're seeing in Hong Kong about, you know, this reputation of Hong Kong people on, um, you know, bad service or yeah. rude behavior and the like? I mean, is this part of that sort of campaign as well, too? Yeah, definitely. I think this is part of the government's bid to sort of um, ease this long-standing feud, as you mentioned, between ride-hailing platforms and taxis. Um, the taxi lobby has been quite strong in Hong Kong. They've been pushing back constantly on the regulation um, of ride-hailing platforms. And so we're seeing some of these concerns play out, even with the proposals that they've laid out, some of the associations saying that they don't see the need for this kind of regulation um, and so so we'll see going forward how the government will be able to balance some of those interests all right Sarah thank you Sarah Jung there our China tech reporter on the latest uh, here in Hong Kong when it comes to some of these ride hailing apps as well you can get an insider's guide also to the money and people shaping up the finance hub in our new Hong Kong edition newsletter that's out every Thursday you can sign up to the website bloomberg.com slash newsletters this is the China show I think the chance of a 10% correction is highly likely sometime between now and the election. Not just because of the election, but because uncertainty is going to prevail for a lot of different reasons. Earnings reasons, you know, election outcome reasons, some of the things you mentioned earlier around tariffs, potentially immigration, Fed policy still remains uncertain. So yeah, I think the third quarter typically is that period and it's gonna be choppy. That was Mike Wilson there out of Morgan Stanley warning. I think it's a 10% correction in what they expect and outlining there some of the market risks. Back to markets here. They said, I mean, it's, it's uh, everything but China, really, uh, move, moving, to the, uh, moving to the upside, more, more in the broader markets. But yeah, I mean, to that point, too, right? So we are set for a correction uh, on the Hang Seng China Index. We're trading at 62.65, the level... Uh, that gets us there is if we close below 62.68 spot for it sounds like a phone number, but not that's a level to watch 
Uh, if we close below that, we are in a correction. Yep, and really the joining likes of MSCI China, Thanks. HS Tech, which kind of fell to those milestones. And also, as Jeannie mentioned from her team, they're watching when the Hang Seng actually erases year those year-to-date gains. gains as well. So watching two things, really, in these Hong Kong markets in particular. But as Dave mentioned, Global Macro Movers is doing this year right now, where actually the rest of uh, Asia, ex-China, is actually doing quite well in the equity world. Look at the Nikkei. We're up 1.4%. Oh, um, you're watching, of course, the dollar is a little bit firmer against most Asia FX here this morning. Uh, but we're watching very closely that fourth column, which is sovereign bonds, right? In particular, that top one, that Chinese 10-year yield is down about one basis point. So at least the sell-off is taking a bit of a breather here today after what we have seen, this concern of what the, the PBOC is doing by confirming or at least controlling the yield curve. Yeah, we're still trying to wrap our heads around what this means moving forward. In fact, we have the perfect guest coming up to talk us through this. Becky Leo will be joining us out of Standard Charter to talk us through some of these reforms, narrowing the quarter. Plus, we'll also talk cross asset with Sylvia Shung out of JP Morgan Asset in the next hour of The China Show. to the China show. Here's a look at the CSI 300 just a half hour into the session. It looks like we snapped out of five days of losses here. So we're seeing a slight upside here. So things turning a little bit more positive, at least in the onshore market. Uh, the Hang Seng is where we're seeing a little bit more of that weakness here this morning. As we talk about here, eight shares are set to enter that technical correction here if we actually end uh, this way here as well. Hong Kong, though, also pairing some losses, though, in the last few minutes or so. So things looking maybe a little bit better than maybe half an hour ago, Dave. Yeah, um, and hopefully that continues as we come off lows. Uh, some movers to tell you about. So everyone's watching what's happening with Maltai, of course, given the down draft there. We are seeing a bit of a pickup there in some of the liquor makers, number one. Number two, China National Building um, guidance coming through as far as losses go for the first half. Uh, a reminder, really, that we are entering uh, earnings season in a couple of weeks. So, uh, stay tuned for that. Of course, Hua Hong Semi, this big move up, of course, across some of the semi plays. NVIDIA overnight, you know, we talked about TSMC, the ADRs at one point overnight valued the company at, what, uh, a trillion dollars. And, of course, TSMC here uh, in, in the Asian session, unchanged, as you can see. And, of course, Xpeng leading some of the losses. He had a big uh, d pullback in Chinese EVs overnight, uh, mirror move that we're seeing here uh, in, in the region. Right, very quickly, Asia is looking better uh, compared to... Uh, specifically China strategies today. We're looking at MSCI Asia. Uh, we're flat, although the big mover here, we'll talk more about this later, is really what's happening on the Nikkei 225. Again, this is a new record there on the index itself. All, of, all that being said, it's quiet ahead, of course, of JP, Jay Powell, set to speak, of course, at Capitol Hill, Washington. Will he turn dovish? Did he see enough in the soft data to merit a turn yeah. or is he going to push back against the notion that cuts are coming in September? There's that and then there's also the CPI, core CPI on Thursday that yeah. your bond traders are really watching out for. But it looks like a lot of these traders are looking at the second half uh, long when it comes to bonds as well, just given where they're likely to see or hopefully hoping to see an easing cycle ensue in the U.S. Take a look at what comes to CGBs, though. There you go. So we're seeing now at least things, the yield curve heading a little, shifting a little bit lower here this morning, a little bit of a correction in the one-year yield after we did see, a, a, I think, the biggest move in two months uh, on those yields to the upside yesterday on the back of what we heard from the PBOC, essentially sort of talking about how they're going to start having a tighter grip when it comes to uh, these rates. So certainly this is one thing to watch, but there was quite a bit of confusion. And I think people are still digesting what this all means. Let's bring us bring in Becky Liu, head of China Macro Strategy at Standard Charter Bank. It seems like, for one thing, it looks like people are interpreting this as a way to cool this rally in CGBs. But, but what do you think really is happening with the PBOC? Uh, first of all, uh, I think we can confirm that this is not a change of monetary policy stance. We believe that PBOC is still very firmly on an easing trajectory for many more quarters uh, ahead of us. But in the short term, what they are trying to do is to anchor both the back end of the curve by selling CGBs, uh, that's what they are uh, flagging to the market, and on the front end of the curve, the key purpose is to narrow the corridor and uh, reduce the volatility. So uh, technically, in the short term, we would uh, have already seen a 
rebound of bond yield because of those operations. But uh, the purpose, it's mainly um, uh, one an uh, anchor the back end of the curve in order to prevent a inversion of the CGB yield curve. And on the front end, um, it's more about uh, reducing volatility to make the open market operation rate more effectively as the next policy rate, rather than trying to tighten liquidity in our view. Does this lead to a steeper curve then? Yes, exactly. So on the back end, they are very clearly telling the market that their desirable range for 30 years CGB yield is somewhere between two and a half to three percent. And therefore, it has come back to around two and a half percent on the back of all these operations. But on the front end, uh, we believe that there would be room for them to cut multiple times in the quarters ahead. Hmm. Can you blame what, what people are, are interpreting this, though? Because, you know, in, in some ways, they're juggling all these different balls right now, right? They, they want to lower rates, but they can't because of the weaker currency. They're concerned of that. But then they also don't want to, you know, annihilate the, the banks and, and their net interest margins. Yeah, and, they don't the wanna, and they don't want to fuel bond speculation as well. So I think, you know, is, is, do you think that sell-off was justified in some way, too? Uh, yes, it's uh, justified on a technical, uh, uh, on the back of a technical reason. But as you correctly pointed out, I think what the PBOC is sending out is a very confusing signal. People have no idea whether they want rates to go higher or lower. So fundamentally, we believe they still need rates to come lower. But in the short term, they are facing a number of constraints. One is the CMY, because CMY's uh, seasonality is the, the most negative in the third quarter, because dividend payment is peaking this month and next month. So we are already seeing them moving up, fixing much faster in order to avoid a situation of uh, the onshore spot being unable to trade when it gets too close to the weak band. Yeah. But on the other hand, um, they are also getting the system ready, uh, as what Pan Gong Sung mentioned earlier, towards a new monetary policy framework, which will enable them to cut rates more aggressively uh, on the back of the disassociation between the long rate and the MLF rate. And that's the key reason that they need to de-emphasize the MLF rate and move the target to OMO rate. So the, uh, this new, uh, newly introduced corridor is basically uh, cementing the open market operation rate as the next de facto policy rate target. Yeah, the benchmark. In fact, we're going to show it to our viewers. You mentioned the word confusion. The toolkit is, when you look at it on the surface, I don't know, 10 to 15 different rates. And this is not even everything. The legend so. actually overtakes the, <laughs> the lines on the chart. I mean, is, you know, how important is communicating to the market, to your point, what the benchmark is, what no longer is as necessary, yeah. and how that affects monetary policy? Uh, that's very uh, right. So uh, currently the market or the interest rate system in China is very fragmented because they are halfway done through this interest rate liberalization. So right. that previously when they target the MLF and link up the MLF to the long rate, i.e. the LPR rate, right. the net result is a asymmetric rate cut, ending up cutting only the long rate but not the deposit rate. Okay. So they are now hitting a wall because NIM compression is too severe mm. and they can't squeeze margin anymore. So the ultimate target in our view is to be able to align these rates much better. So they need to anchor one rate and, uh, this, uh, and decide deposit rate uh, uh, or the overall cost of liability as well as the asset yield also based on that one rate uh, like the mature systems. So over time we believe that the target is to link up the OMO rate with both the liability cost as well as the asset yield in the future and at the same time to realign all these PBOC lending tools across PSL, MLF, relending, rediscounting rates towards a single target. It yeah. could be priced at a, at a spread over a target, but they need to be able to move together. Okay, and you mentioned this could actually steepen the yield curve. What, what, what sort of ranges are you looking at on the short and the long end yeah. of the curve now? Uh, the, the steepening of the yield curve is very much uh, talking about the CGB, the cash bond yield curve. Okay. Uh, if we talk about the other curve, for example, IRS or NDIRS, that would actually be a flattening uh, 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 scenario. So they have been diverging since the beginning of this year. So we have seen CGB yield curve continue to steepen, especially after April, but the NDIRS curve actually, it's mostly been uh, flattening. So when it comes to a target, we don't believe that they have a, no, uh, a nominal level of target, but they want to make 
maintain upward sloping of the CGB yield curve. So um, in the foreseeable future, we still see possibility for the PBOC to be cutting the OMO rate by about 20 basis points by the end of this year. So that's going to shift the front end of the curve lower. For the back end, we believe they would also be comfortable to move, uh, move it parallel uh, lower because market forces would be um, uh, still calling for long, long dated bonds in China. Yeah, and you know, the is the well they, they can do all of these things but if the banks don't pass it on it really doesn't matter as far as the real economy is concerned right so do you expect if if the interest rate differentials are incentivizing now the banks to be able to pass that on without killing their profit mm -hmm. should we expect or when should we expect bank lending to pick up because this economy needs bank lending to pick up uh, it would still take some time in, in our view because what they have been doing especially since April uh, by removing the higher yielding uh, short-term deposit mm. would effectively remove a lot of the arbitrage loans, uh, loans. In the past, like some of the loans were lent out in very low rates and they immediately got deposit back to the banking sector in order to, just to boost the credit growth or boost loan growth mm. because that used to be one of the performance targets at the banking sector. But now they have revised all those. So, so all these fake loans will no longer be there and therefore this is a structural change and it's going to take much longer for things to materialize. But we do believe that the banking sector after this uh, round of the revamp uh, will be more willing uh, to pass on the uh, monetary policy signal to both uh, the cost of liabilities as well as loans. So so far they're only guided on the loan side and in the future we feel the uh, focus will, remove, uh, will, will move uh, back to the liability side when it comes to deposit uh, rate or the other type of uh, liabilities in the banking sector. Okay, so we're seeing some reforms when it comes to the, the rates mm -hmm. environment. I mean, we're, we're just a week away from the plenum. Mm -hmm. What are you expecting in terms of any other reforms that could really boost this economy again? Uh, we think, like, based on all uh, all the recent state media <laughs> reports, our feeling is that they are still going all in in this uh, new productive forces. So we do not expect a material deviation away from this. So the risk to the market is that uh, the bulk of the policies may remain supply side rather than demand side. Although people have been talking a lot about the consumption tax um, uh, reform, which might incentivize some of the local governments to be boosting consumption because that would bring in tax income for the local governments, but that would be a long-term story. It takes multiple years for things to happen. Uh, the other risk that we are seeing is that uh, when it comes to fiscal reform, there has been a lot of hope that they will allocate more fiscal income to the local governments because of the debt issue. But the reality uh, could be the other way around because if you look to align expenditure and income, there are two ways to do so. They can as well curb income and at the same time curb their expenditure expenditure as well. Okay. Um, <laughs> anything else that we haven't talked about? <laughs> uh, make it in simple English, of course, for our, for our viewers. <laughs> anything we should know looking at the, looking at this, the, the second half? Um, I, I think in the short term, especially next week, the other interesting thing to move is uh, to look at is the MLF operation. In the past, the 15th of each month uh, has become the de facto monetary policy decision day in China because yeah, MLF decision day. Uh, yeah. Exactly. And now, given the fact that they want to de-emphasize the MLF and want to focus on the OMO, and oh. OMO is being executed on a daily basis twice now, sometimes. Yeah. Uh, exactly. <laughs> uh, so, so it remains to be seen whether the state would remain the monetary policy. Oh. The, uh, decision day, so that's a near-term uh, story. And the other one is uh, obviously uh, how they are going to link up the new uh, OMO rate to loan rate, i.e., how LPR rate is going to be priced in the future if they uh, if MLF rate is no longer a component there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Becky. Thank you. Once again, that. the perfect guest to talk us through all that that's going on right now. So every day, every day is rate decision day, <laughs> and, and, and twice on Sunday. <laughs> Becky Liu, head of China macro strategy at Standard Chartered Bank. Still ahead, the Hungarian prime minister angers Western allies with his surprise visits to China and Russia. We discuss the implications of what he's calling a peace mission. This is Bloomberg. All right, two benchmarks here in Hong Kong, two on shore, all down for the day. And the Hang Seng China Index is set to enter a technical correction, joining the Hang Seng and also MSCI China today. Uh, we're now done also a sixth straight day in onshore 
stocks. Yep, and we're watching, of course, one stock in particular in Taiwan, uh, which is, of course, TSMC. I think we're not doing a whole lot today in, in, in the TIEX, but certainly, you know, what we saw last night in these ADRs was something, right? So basically hitting a milestone and reaching that $1 trillion market cap uh, overnight. Let's get to Annabelle Jewelers, or tech reporter, on more on this. Yeah, so what's next after we reach this milestone? Well, actually, what's next? I mean, there are some analysts saying we've got tech advancements going into the 2040s. Wow. So we, we might have a little bit more room to run on this story. But essentially, overnight, we had Morgan Stanley boosting their price target on the stock and joining a lot of other brokers and turning more bullish. And so that was just enough to get it to surpass into that $1 trillion market cap. I emphasize the U.S. here because this chart here just points out you actually have two listings. You've got the ADRs, as you said, on Wall Street. That's what you see in orange. TSMC in Taiwan is the line in white and they do pretty much trade in unison but at different entry points and also the Wall Street ones can be more attractive mm. partly because they're a lot more accessible to investors. Anyway, that's where we saw that $1 trillion market cap and as we said, TSMC is in a really great position here. It's the sole supplier of the most important chips to the likes of Apple, Nvidia and it's really again all down to that AI trade. Yeah, so more upside. Even if we, even if you could argue the stock look expensive, they're the only player in town. You, you do understand why some of the price targets are still suggesting some upside here. Yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah. as I said, Morgan Stanley, for instance, they're seeing at least nine percent further upside from their target from here. Uh, Morningstar as well, but there's, there's a lot more that are that are very bullish on the stock. Nomura, Mizuho, JP Morgan. These are all the names that are quite optimistic, and and this is as well important to note. We're just even at the outset of the reporting period because we've got the second. Quarter quarter numbers that are coming out and the expectation, again, strong revenue growth, perhaps 35% revenue growth on the year. We could see revenue guidance as well uh, revised higher. Okay. Meanwhile, there's another story where we look at some of these chip makers in Japan. Mm. They, they look a little bit more vulnerable. Why? Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a different story there. And, and it comes down to quite an interesting phenomenon we're seeing around retail investors. So margin buying has really picked up in popularity there. And of course, yeah, you're bullish about a stock. You want to buy more. Maybe you don't have enough capital. You go to your bank or your broker. You get them to loan you. And, and you see a lot of activity. And here, this chart, for instance, you're seeing the most margin buying now positions going all the way back to 2006. What happens is it introduces a little bit of an element of vulnerability because of the market weakens. Investors need to close out their positions, at least to further selling pressure and so on. And that is perhaps a risk in Japan, most acute in the tech sector as well. That interest, again, comes down to AI. A Tokyo Electron, for instance, that has the highest number of margin positions out of the whole Topics 500 index, uh, nearly $300 million just this year alone. Are there other sectors beyond tech where we're seeing margin positioning moving up as well? Yeah, it's sort of the similar theme, but and again, it relates to AI. Of course, we talk a lot about sort of the picks and shovels in the AI race as well. Yeah. Look for those names in more like the data infrastructure, energy, utilities, and that's sort of the names where you're seeing that pick up in margin buying activities. So names like uh, Tokyo Electric Power, Hokkaido Electric Power, both of those have seen a pick up in, in positions. Of course, the question again comes down to how much does this really matter? <laughs> Is it going to have any sort of bearing on, on market activity? Uh, again, that will depend on perhaps what comes out of the earnings that are just around the corner. If you see any sort of move from the BOJ, even a, a 25 basis point hike still makes margin positions or, or buying on margin more expensive, those positions, so as I said, just a fraction of the total market cap. All right, Bell. Thank you, Annabelle Drillers, our tech reporter, with the latest on all things AI, margin buying, the like here. Uh, we also spoke with the Bridgewater co-CIO, Greg Jensen. He's saying that he expects AI to help boost human investing over the next five years. He spoke with us after the hedge fund firm launched a $2 billion fund that uses machine learning as a primary basis for its decision making. When we think about it from a pure alpha perspective, most of what we built up at Bridgewater is an expert system based on everything we've learned over the 40 years, mainly on how economic cycles work. And big productivity miracles are pretty separate from economic cycles. So when you look at what we're doing at pure alpha, we're generally um, trying to make sure we don't have too much exposure. Um, to whether the productivity miracle works out or not. So when we trade U.S. equities, we trade them kind of with AI hedged because the pressures, the, the normal cyclical pressures will play out on the regular companies. And when you look at U.S. stocks, it's kind of the regular companies that we'd say are pretty expensive relative to the rest of the world. 
mediocre companies in the U.S. have a U.S. premium in them relative to the rest of the world. Now, the great companies in the U.S. are the companies hitting the cutting edge. That's a different story. And it's very different than 1999, 2000. Having, I've been at Bridgewater for 29 years and having lived through 99, 2000. That bubble was all about future expectations. Most of what's priced into um, equities today actually would say are based on what's happening right now. I mean, what's happening with NVIDIA's demand is just is incredible. And whether it's slightly overpriced or slightly underpriced or whatever, it's a close call. This is not like the 99 bubble, in, at least in, mm -hmm. in my view, because the earnings for those companies are actually there in a way they weren't there for a company like Cisco in, in 1999. So there is a big difference. Now, you still need those earnings to be sustainable, which requires a continued growth in those areas, but not a not an outlandish one. And that really comes to what internally. So there's we need to understand AI from a macro perspective. And then we need to understand it from a as a user, a micro perspective, right? That in our IA labs, which is 25 people we set aside at Bridgewater fully focused on using machine learning for everything you need to do to invest in markets, that group we're hands-on. We see both the problems. There are many problems. The language models off the shelf have many problems with them. But if you can combine them with data models, you can create this incredible strength. And, um, and right now, I, I expect over the next five years, so much of what human investors and analysts can do can be better done with machine intelligence. So that's been a journey for me. I've been looking at this for you know, Bridgewater built an expert system based on human intuition being translated into algorithms. Right. For AI having machine learning generate the ideas, generate the algorithms. That's been kind of a dream for me. And the technologies really came together in 2022 or so that the pieces came together such that I thought we were ready to build an artificial investor. And we've moved down that track at rapid rate. And that was Greg Jensen there, the Bridgewater co-CI, speaking, of course, on the debut of Bloomberg's Open Interest. Of course, catch that show, of course, one of uh, our newest offerings here on the channel. Right, um, if you're a Bloomberg subscriber, of course, catch up on maybe that, or if there are some other interviews that you might have missed, of course, for a client, TV Go is where you go to catch everything you may have missed. Conversation, of course, be part of them. Send us instant messages uh, to our team, to us, to our producers during our live shows. If you have a question you want to get in, sneak them into our DMs. You have our permission. There we go. <laughs> this is TV Go. Welcome back. Some top corporate stories that we're tracking today. Microsoft has told employees in China that from September, they'll only be able to use iPhones for work. According to an internal memo, the measure is part of a company-wide effort to protect against hackers. Google Play isn't available in China, leaving Apple's App Store as the only place Microsoft employees can download mandatory security apps. United Airlines says another of its Boeing aircraft lost a main landing gear wheel while taking off Monday from Los Angeles. No one was injured on the flight that landed safely in Denver. The incident is similar to the one abroad a United flight in March, which helped trigger a federal safety review of the carrier. Meanwhile, Boeing is said to be in talks with the U.S. Defense Department to preserve its government contract business, and that's after the company pleaded guilty to a criminal charge tied to two fatal crashes of its 737 Max Jet. BYD has signed a deal with Turkey for a $1 billion factory. The company wants to produce 150,000 electric and hybrid vehicles each year in the plant, which also includes a research and development center. The move could bolster the Chinese automaker's foothold in Europe. Turkey is not an EU member, but has a custom seal with the bloc. Yeah, let's stay on the auto theme, and then we'll talk about the Apple story. Well, the Apple angle to the Microsoft story in a moment. So auto driving stocks, particularly those that are autonomous driving related, to be more specific, and as you can see, substantial upside on your screens here. Uh, this is after Beijing has drafted new rules and is effectively seeking public feedback on those draft rules to promote the quality development of the industry. So markets are reacting to perhaps a policy push. Uh, in that direction. Now, let's turn the page, please, and have a look at some Apple suppliers traded here, and you are seeing some upside. And by the way, this is juxtaposed against a, a downdraft story, uh, equity market-wise, with Microsoft ordering staff in China to swap Androids for their iPhones. Maybe that's, are there that much 
Microsoft staff to move the market? Anyway, that's <laughs> rethinking that. CGBs are catching a bit today. Yeah, at least we're seeing a bit of more calm, I guess, uh, in the CGB market here. If we mean, we're still digesting what this whole PBOC introducing, this sort of end of the trading day reverse repo or temporary reverse repo. What does that mean? Adding that extra tool. Uh, we did hear from Stanchar saying, look, it's all about narrowing the interest rate corridor, linking the OMO with other things. And so certainly a lot to digest here today. Eleven twenty nine a.m. in Tokyo. Japanese markets are heading to that lunch break here in just a minute or so. Here's how uh, things are a pulse check of really what's going on in Japan here. And obviously, we haven't seen a whole lot of moves uh, when it comes to uh, the, the, the JGB market. But really, one sixty one handle for dollar uh, dollar yen. So that's a bit of weakness there. But yes, this equity market seems to be liking that. You take a look at the Nikkei. We are now up close to one and a half percent. Yeah, the rest of the markets, though, looking like this. So Asia were effectively flat, and we would be lower if not uh, for the Nikkei, of course. Uh, U.S. futures are still pushing higher, just in case you're wondering. We're up about two-tenths of one percent on U.S. futures. There we go. Uh, we're not really seeing a lot of movement in the Treasury market. And keep in mind, of course, Jay Powell is on deck today, so uh, in a couple of hours. So stay tuned for any potential pivot. Uh, it's worth noting, of course, that he has taken most... Uh, of the past opportunities, if the data did suggest, of course, he could step in and be dovish. He's done that, so we'll see, of course, whether or not he thinks that last week's data set, the software numbers coming through do merit, of course, a change in the tone out of the Fed. Are we going to get rate cuts? What does the second half of the year look like? Cross-asset for markets. Let's bring in Sylvia Sheng, a global multi-asset strategist at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. Uh, do we stick with the winners for the second half? Yes, so we still think that um, the equities overall were still overweight, and we, our preference is still with the U.S. as well as Europe. We think that high-quality theme will continue to play, and the kind of beneficiaries of the AI and tech theme will continue to run. Hmm. Maybe how much conviction is there still around equities? Because it seems like the, the macro backdrop is a bit different in the second half, right? You're still talking about slowing growth momentum. Um, you're talking about a Fed that might be higher for longer, which is very different from what we heard from the beginning of the year when people were pricing in six rate cuts for this year. Is that going to make it more challenging for stocks, though? So for us, we do think that the earnings backdrop is very important. Yes, we're seeing some moderation, but we think it's still pretty solid pace around kind of trend level. So we think that provides a good backdrop for earnings. Valuation, probably not too much kind of room for it to expand from here. But we do think valuation, if you compare to the profitability measures, is not that elevated. Yep. What about in Europe, though, where the picture seems to be slowing slightly more than what we're seeing risk in the, is coming in the back. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think near term, yes, a lot of political noises and political event risks. But if you look at more medium term, we still think that a lot of the kind of uh, growth perspective, we have seen it probably bottomed out um, late last year. We're seeing a very modest recovery taking place. And also we have uh, this expectation that global goods cycle should recover and that should be a positive boost for Europe as well. Um, how do you see stocks and bonds you know, performing for the rest of the year because it seems like before stocks were much more, I guess, sens less sensitive to what the Fed would say. The bond market certainly reacted a little bit more. Can I still think that these correlations can stay the same in, in the, for the rest of the year or? Yes, so we do think that the positive correlation between stocks and bonds we have seen kind of lately probably will continue, but as inflation cools, that correlation probably will reduce a little bit. But we do think that um, even for the rest of this year, that positive correlation is still a theme. Now, in, in fixed income, I know you've been, you've been sticking to investment grade and high yield, which have done well. Is, is that still the strategy to go? Or, you know, if, if the you know, global easing cycle is indeed... Uh, getting on in earnest, do we do we pivot to government bonds or what, what's your what's your take on fixed income? Yes, yeah, so for now we still like uh, both IG and high yield in okay. the U.S. We do think that OEN yield is still pretty attractive, so that's really the carry opportunities we'll want to play here. I think even with kind of a global central banks pivot to easing, especially when you look at the Fed, we think it's relatively modest easing cycle. Kind of before mid next year, probably we're looking at kind of two three cuts. So that's very modest, and given where ten year yield is. Is at with the U.S. Treasuries, we don't think there's much room for them to move sharply lower from here. Okay. Uh, what about 
the back half, which is this this election. Obviously, we talk about political risk. Yeah. It seems like we've seen a swing in market expectations after this first presidential debate. Are you looking at you know how things can change in the back half if, in fact, we're talking about Trump 2.0? Yes, so I think for now we still think it's probably a bit too early to look at the election. Normally, historically, it's about two to three months before the election actually takes place when market pays more attention to it. But we are focused on potential changes in terms of fiscal policy as well as trade policy, and especially with kind of trade policy, probably more of an impact outside of the U.S. as well. Are you are you getting queries on China? Where, where, where does China belong in your portfolio right now? I, I think China now we're, we're neutral, and uh, we're basically looking at a case where on the economic side we're seeing a stabilization in growth momentum but I guess the question is still on domestic demand it's still relatively weak right now with still lingering questions about the property sector um, also questions about where policy is actually going so far we're still seeing very modest easing whether they're going to be kind of new releases new reforms being announced uh, next week yeah and it's you know we it, it, it seems markets are in a good place. You know, volatility has come down cross asset. Do you see anything that might upset this 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 period of quiet? Yeah. I think it's really about this kind of case, base case of soft landing that uh, I guess the market is all buying into, whether there could be a growth scare, people more worried about this growth slowdown, and clearly any geopolitical risks also could accept, upset Fantastic. that. All right, Sylvia, thank you. Sylvia Shang, their global multi-asset strategist at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. And we also heard from Morgan Stanley's chief U.S. equity strategist, Michael Wilson. He's saying that investors should brace for a potential correction in the S&P in the coming months. So Wilson told us more about where he's seeing risks in these U.S. markets. What worries me is that that momentum is so strong and people have a lot more exposure to high multiple stocks than they think they do. And if you have an event that's unpredictable, then you could have a real reset on valuation of 10, 15 percent. Like I think the chance of a 10 percent correction is highly likely sometime between now and the election. Not just because of the election, but because uncertainty is going to prevail for a lot of different reasons. Earnings reasons, you know, election outcome reasons, some of the things you mentioned earlier around tariffs, potentially immigration, Fed policy still remains uncertain. So yeah, I think the third quarter typically is that period and it's gonna be choppy. Now we're hoping that's gonna create some opportunity, but like right here, valuations to me look very, very unexciting. And uh, it's a great point, too, on you might be more exposed to tech than you think, especially if you're sitting in the S&P 500, which right. is, what, 30 percent uh, tech or so. I do want to actually talk about how all this rolls into price targets. And typically at this point, I would ask you what your year-end S&P 500 forecast is. But I know that you've backed away from those sorts of calls. And it was interesting. If you take a look at Friday, we got some news from Piper Sandler saying that they're actually going to drop their S&P 500 forecasts, that basically it's bad practice. And when you, you think Think about that. I mean, are we starting to see the beginning of the end of these big, bold S&P 500 forecasts? Well, no. We, what we do is we rolled forward our forecast 12 months in May, so we take away our year-end target. And, and look, first thing I would say is S&P targets at a certain time and price is kind of silly. But what, we, what I would tell you is that the risk-reward from here we think is lower. Like over the next four to six months, for the same reason I just mentioned, we have volatility probably picking up in the third quarter. I would say your upside, your likelihood of upside between now and year-end is very low, lo much lower than normal. I'd call it 20, 25 percent that markets are higher between now and year end. OK, specific target. I don't know. But let's say it's down 10 percent or so. Then we would get interested and you know, then we'd be interested to say, OK, maybe there's some things happening at the index level where the opportunity remains is at the stock level, at the factor level. OK, and in that regard, we still like sort of growth, but not just quality, quality, quality growth, but like, you know, quality in general, large cap, good balance sheets, companies that can deliver on earnings and that momentum will continue. It's just hard to find companies that are cheap. So if they were to come in 10 percent, then we'd probably get interested again. Mike Wilson there, Morgan Stanley's chief U.S. equity strategist, speaking, of course, on the debut of Bloomberg's open interest. Right, just ahead here on shows, we're moving into geopolitics. Well, Chinese President Xi Jinping re repeating his call for a ceasefire in Ukraine during talks, of course, with the Hungarian prime minister who is in town. More on that surprise visit and meeting in Beijing. Just ahead, this is Bloomberg.
Welcome back. You're watching The China Show. The primar uh, Prime Minister of Hungary, uh, Viktor Orban, has met with Chinese President Xi Jinping during this unannounced visit. Well, we now know about it, of course, in, in Beijing. The fo that, well, that followed a surprise trip to Moscow for talks then with Vladimir Putin. Uh, Min Min Lau, China correspondent, joins us here in our studios to talk us through this. I mean, this is supposed to be a peace mission, but it certainly caught what, uh, some observers by surprise. Yes, well, uh, Hungary has just assumed the presidency, the six-month rotating presidency of the EU, and Prime Minister Viktor Orban is just taking the title and running with it because he made surprise visits to Ukraine and Russia last week, and now he's appeared in Beijing in talks with President Xi, who then called for the ceasefire and praised his efforts and diplomacy. But this has drawn rebuke from Western nations, the EC president in particular, saying that Viktor Orban doesn't have the mandate to deal with the likes of Russia on behalf of the EU and there's a falling out with Germany as well after the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz criticized Viktor Orban's trip um, and Hungary then cancelled a, a meeting a visit by the German Foreign Minister to Budapest that was supposed to take place yesterday so these EU ambassadors they're going to seek clarity on this trip on Wednesday during their regular meeting and it doesn't end here Viktor Orban is now going to make his way to Washington for that NATO summit where Ukraine is going to be front and center and Hungary Hungarian uh, cabinet minister said that they will not rule out a meeting with former U.S. President Donald Trump as well. And we know Trump has said in his, in his election debate with Biden that he wants to end this war in Ukraine quickly and he might very well just endorse Auburn's uh, vision of a peace deal uh, if he were elected to be president. Yeah, it's interesting, this sort of shuttle diplomacy, as they're calling it. Uh, but he's known to be a bit of a disruptor. I mean, what, what came out of uh, these talks, though, with the president in China? Yeah, so President Xi and Prime Minister Viktor Orban, they're just piling praises on each other and on Chinese state-linked media as well. There's been a lot of publicity about this trip, really portraying China and Hungary as these two peace-loving nations and painting Viktor Orban as the only voice of reason and pragmatism in the EU as well. But of course, the EU, EU nations see otherwise. They see Viktor Orban as just trying to pursue its own self-interest, signing deals with Russia and China. And President Xi had also urged Prime Minister Orban to help further promote EU-China ties during his uh, assumption of this uh, presidency as well. And this comes amid those trade tensions, the tariffs on Chinese EVs, and of course Hungary already play host to several Chinese companies that are looking to open up plants in Hungary to make EVs and batteries to export to the rest of the Union uh, and bypassing those customs duties in that process. All right, Min Min, thank you. Min Min Lo, there, our China correspondent, with the latest uh, on the Hungarian Prime Minister. Now, Bloomberg has learned that India and Russia will probably agree on a long-term uranium supply pact as Prime Minister Narendra Modi visits Moscow. For more on this, let's bring in our government reporter, Sudhi Ranjan Sen. He joins us from New Delhi here this morning. So, Sudhi, what more do we know about this possible deal? Well, what we're getting to here is most likely there is going to be this long-term uranium supply deal uh, for, and these would be meant for the civilian uh, nuclear reactors that are there in the southern part of India, in the state of Tamil Nadu, which is being built with Russian help from, you know, and with Russian companies. Um, the two units uh, of that nuclear reactor is already up. The rest of the other four units are under construction. Uh, the supply of the the uranium uh, for the nuclear reactors is for uh, not only for these but could also be used for the other civilian reactors that India has uh, it's it's you know at one level it is a very routine thing at another level it is very very interesting because of the timing in which India and Russia is uh, are kind of doing this deal um, so so that is that is why you know uh, experts and people who watch India Russia relations are looking at this very very carefully we are also being told that apart from the long-term nuclear uh, nuclear supply fuel supply deal what can be expected are discussions and perhaps even agreements in fertilizer production right um, and apart from that you know we I think I believe we still have a few more bilats uh, taking place today is there anything else we should be keeping an eye on here Oh, the the other other bilat, which of course under discussion now in futuration, I mean it's it's been agreed by both sides, is the military 
logistic supply agreement. Now, while India has and other countries like the United States and several others in the West have logistic supply agreement, one, the India is likely to sign one with Russia. And why that becomes important is then Russian warships uh, in the Indian Ocean region can therefore use Indian ports and Indian facilities to refurbish and refuel, uh, therefore giving them very, very long legs. At the same point of time, what India is looking at from this uh, from this deal is to use the same facilities, port facilities in Russia to explore the new Arctic routes that are opening up. Uh, obviously, the Indian Ocean region is one of the most militarized and increasingly one of the most contested regions in the world. We are seeing, uh, you know, around 100 to 110 warships at any given point of time. And the main contestation, therefore, in the, in the Indian Ocean region is between the United States in China. So it just adds another dimension to it and perhaps some more warships in the region. Sudhi, thank you so much. Sudhi Ranjan Sen in Delhi for us, our government reporter. Just ahead here on shows, China makes its largest outreach yet to young Americans, but it's uh, not all smooth sailing. Find out why and what's taking place exactly. That's up next. This is Bloomberg. Here's your China Brief, a look at what's making headlines in national newspapers and trending on social media. As we look ahead to the release of June's financial data, the Securities Daily thinks new credit for the month may actually show a monthly increase. Now, the report estimates that social financing will exceed 3 trillion yuan. And analysts quoted see some factors affecting June's credit supply, including insufficient financing demand. Yeah, another article in the paper predicts that the June CPI rate could rebound slightly. Now, industry insiders say, uh, well, say they spoke with, uh, what well, we spoke with believe that could be due to pork prices maybe uh, going in that direction. Now, we're set, of course, to get both consumer and factory inflation numbers coming out tomorrow. And state media is also focused on India Prime Minister Narendra Modi's trip to Russia. The Global Times ran this cartoon and accused the West of attempting to sow discord between India, Russia and China. Now, that's according to an expert they spoke with who noted that India's relations with both Russia and the West reflect a complex international landscape. Now, here, here's an interesting piece we're going to get into right now, and we're staying on geopolitics. So China's efforts to open channels of communication with young Americans may be getting lost in translation. Now, U.S. participants say this event held in the Fujian province last month was awash with scripted moments and lacking in open dialogue. Uh, Colin Murphy actually covered that event for us. Uh, he's a China government reporter. He's with us right now out of Beijing. Yeah, uh, Colin, I mean, maybe give us some background. How did this program come about? Who was involved? And what was it like when yeah, you sure. were there? Well, first of all, I had a really great time reporting on this trip. I got to hang out with uh, lots of young people, which, by the way, under the definition that uh, the Chinese are putting out, is anybody up to age 40. So there's, there's a, a lot of scope there for, be, for participation. But basically, it goes back <laughs> to last November when uh, Xi Jinping was in uh, San Francisco and he met with Joe Biden. And at that time, he announced uh, Quite suddenly, I would say, uh, that he had this goal of uh, 50,000 young Americans uh, to China uh, within the next five years. And once, of course, you know, the Chinese leader says something like that, then it happens. And the organizers have been sort of really busy, uh, possibly a little hastily, uh, organizing this event in Fujian, uh, which uh, took place uh, towards the end of last month. And uh, it had about 500 participants overall, but of which uh, 220, roughly, were from the U.S. So, so what did the Americans make of this program and, and all of this right now? I mean, did they find this event was worthwhile? 
Well, yes is the quick answer to that because, you know, the bar is quite low. We have actually had very little access uh, in recent years due to all sorts of things, including COVID and a travel advisory in the U.S. doesn't uh, really help things. So in that context, yes, of course, <laughs> bringing people together, uh, no matter how imperfect it might be, uh, has to be uh, welcomed. But the, the, you know, once you drill down a little bit and then you start to think, OK, what was actually discussed during this uh, week? What were the activities? Uh, did the fact that the actual location of this uh, event was literally on the Taiwan Strait. So at one point, you know, from a nearby hotel, I personally witnessed and saw uh, a Chinese jet fighter buzzing around overhead. But, you know, this wasn't on the agenda. Uh, neither was the South China Sea, which, as, of we, as we all know, is, is now uh, a hot point in terms of what's happening with the Philippines. So there was a sense that these issues were not being addressed. And, you know, what, what does the, have we heard from the U.S. <clears throat> officials? What does the U.S. government uh, make of all of this? So there's a sort of a little bit of ambiguity on the U.S. side because it's, it's not quite clear just how much involvement they have had in the planning of this. And my sense is that there's been very little. And on the other hand, what we are seeing is actually some pushback from the U.S. Uh, in China. So, for example, we had most recently uh, Ambassador Nicholas Burns, who told Bloomberg TV that uh, the Chinese authorities are interfering, uh, especially when the U.S. embassies and consulates here want to to organize uh, public diplomacy type events. So for example, a pride festival in June, a pride reception rather, uh, at the US ambassador's residence in, in Beijing, which I also was in attendance by the way, uh, that was uh, quite low on participants, partly because many of those Chinese people who wanted to, to go there were either deterred uh, either on the way or beforehand. And so the US is sort of looking at this and going, okay, well, you have this you know, elaborate plan um, you're not really including us in, in, in sort of formulating who goes and what, what, what the purpose is going to be. And on top of that, then, you know, when we try to do our uh, initiatives in China, we're, we're, we're facing resistance. I mean, that's the U.S. government line. So I would say, to me, what's quite surprising is that, you know, I mean, of all the things that the U.S. and China need to talk about, could talk about, must talk about, uh, you would imagine that people to people would be pretty, you know, straightforward and, and not something that... Uh, should in, it cause that much uh, tension. But even here, uh, we're seeing that there's scope for uh, disagreement or uh, displeasure uh, between the two sides. Yeah, it's interesting, Colm, as you mentioned. I mean, it's rare to have exchanges like this. But then again, if you're not going to hit these serious issues, what, what can we take from it, right? What, what lessons can we get from, from this, this recent sort of program that you, you witnessed? Well, I, I think many of the lessons probably, hopefully, will be on the Chinese side. I mean, I think a lot of this, we do have to give a little bit of a charitable view on this and say, you know, well, this is kind of the first big initiative. The organizers, by the way, are, are billing the, this week in Fujian as um, the largest gathering of China-American youth since diplomatic ties began. So, yeah, it's a first step, but we need to sort of get to the serious heart of the matter. And I think, you know, there have been calls for more cooperation on this between the U.S. and China. Right. I think that's one way to, to improve on that. Colin Murphy in Beijing for us, a China government reporter on that story. Um, and yeah, uh, more, of course, on the way. That's done, though, for the China show. Bloomberg Markets Asia is just ahead.